Hello and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from south of Jerusalem here in the Holy Land of Israel. Today is the 20th day of the month of Av, 573. It's August 7th, 2023. I'm recording uh, Temple Talk a little bit early this week due to a busy schedule tomorrow, Tuesday. So uh, here we go. This coming Shabbat, we read Parshat Re'eh in the book of Deuteronomy, beginning chapter 11, verse 26, concluding chapter 16, verse 17, and I get a thrill every time I read Parshat Re'eh, which means see, see that, look. Uh, Why do I get a thrill? Maybe some of you know why I get a thrill every time I read Parshat Re'e, because in Parshat Re'e we are introduced uh, we are introduced by Moshe who of course is part of his 37 day final address to his people that is the book of Deuteronomy. Moshe in Parshat Re'e introduces front and center the Holy Temple. What do I mean by that? Well, we knew we had a Mishkan. We knew we had a tabernacle. We read about its construction all the way back in the book of uh, of, of Exodus. Um, and, you know, we knew that there's going to be a temple eventually, but up till now, except for some poetic references perhaps, there hasn't been any explicit mention of... Um, of the eventual holy temple. But in Parshat Re'e, boy, Moshe talks about it and does he talk about it in clear terms, in beautiful terms, and we're going to be talking about that almost exclusively because I really like the subject. And um, But before we get to that, um, this coming Shabbat is also Shabbat Mavarchin meaning it is the Shabbat that we uh, make a special blessing in, in, ter- in anticipation of the upcoming new month, new moon of Elul, the month of Elul, uh, which is a two-day Rosh Chodesh, beginning Wednesday night, Thursday, uh, next week, not this week, next week, and Thursday night, Friday. And, of course, Elul um, is the is the vestibule, is that the word? It's the the hallway um, that we enter into as we approach Tishrei and the High Holidays, meaning Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and of course Sukkot. So things really start to heat up in the month of Elo. Right now, we are post Tish Ab Av, post the ninth of Av, the fast of the ninth of Av. Uh, commemorating the destruction of the holy temples, and we are past uh, Tuba Av, which was last uh, Tuesday evening, I believe. And of course, Tuba Av, the fifteenth of Av, is a day of love, a day of joy, f- for all sorts of reasons. Um, and uh, we talked about that last week, and also posted a new section, a new page on our website uh, called Tubav, all about the day. And of course, Tubav is a turning point in the calendar because we, that's when it becomes really official. We we put the, the mourning and the sadness uh, associated with the three weeks behind us. Of course, we never put the Holy Temple and our need to build it and our desire to build it, and Hashem's desire that we build it, we never put that behind us. That is always in front of us. But uh, come uh, Tuba Av, and we we accept Hashem's comfort, comforting for our loss, and we move on. Move on, meaning again, like I said a moment ago, not move on like, oh well, too bad. It was nice while we had it. No, move on, meaning let's focus once again, on building the Holy Temple so that we don't have to go through the whole three weeks of mourning cycle each year. Because once upon a time, believe it or not, the month of Av 
was a very happy month. We had this beautiful holiday of Tuba'av, which preceded Tisha B'Av. I mean, it was a holiday, even though it's not explicitly mentioned anywhere in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scripture, um, it has a long, long tradition, and there are certain hints, for sure, in Tanakh, in in uh, the Hebrew Scripture, and m- many of the reasons attributed for our celebrating uh, Tu B'Av come all the way from uh, the Israel in the wilderness and through the books of Judges and uh, Samuel, etc., etc. So it's an ancient, ancient, ancient holiday. Also seems to be associated with the wine, the grape harvest, which is this time of the year. And so, yes, once upon a time, the month of Av was just a, a good, happy month. And uh, we can make it a good, happy month again, uh, if we but rebuild a holy temple. And, of course, the month of Av has that additional name, Menachem Av, which literally means the comforting father, because that does come to comfort us. We, we are upset because we, through our bad behavior in the past, allowed Hashem's uh, abode here on earth to be destroyed. Hashem, being Hashem, comes and comforts us, um, which is very, very beautiful. He is our comforting father. Menachem Av literally means comforting father. And that comforting, again, is something that's really part of the the, the feeling of, of Tuba Av, because that's really when when we feel like we can pick ourselves up and, and and move on, move forward, I should say. Anyway, so next uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday is the new month of Elul, and it's a very exciting month, a very busy month, uh, a very intensive month of spiritual preparation, which actually begins also with Tuba Av, because that's the lead up to the lead up, right? So there'll be much to talk about next week concerning Elul, but let's turn right now to Parashat Re'e. Again, it begins in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 11, verse 26. I'll read the first few verses in Hebrew, then in English, Re'e. Anochi noten lifneichem hayom bracha uklala et habracha asher tishmu. El mitvot Hashem Elokechem, Asher Anuchi Matzave et Echem Ayom, Vaha Klala, Im Lotishmu, El mitvot Hashem Elokechem, Osaratem min Aderech Asher Anuchi Matzave et Echem Ayom, Lalechet Achre Elohim Acherim, Asher Lo Yedatem. See, Re means see. See, I present before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing that you hearken to the commandments of Hashem your God that I command you today, and the curse if you do not hearken to the commandments of Hashem your God and you stray from the path that I command you today to follow gods of others that you do not know. It shall be that when Hashem your God brings you to the land to which you come to possess it, that you shall deliver the blessing on Mount Grizim and the curse on Mount Eval. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan, far in the direction of the sunset, in the land of the Can- Canaanite that dwells in the plain from far from Gilgal, near the plains of Moreh? For you are crossing the Jordan to come and possess the land that Hashem, your God, gives you. You shall possess it and you shall settle in it. You shall be careful to perform all the decrees and the ordinances that I present before you today. Okay, that's how the parsha opens. Very dramatic, and of course, Moshe is preparing his people for entering into the land and assuming the responsibility of of conquest, of settling the land, and of uh, creating a a uh, Torah-based society. That's what it's all about, and he's reminding the people of that and, and giving them encouragement. And so interesting, the... The, uh, the subject matter here of the blessings and the curses on Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval, which are two mountains, as you know, right outside the city of Shechem, commonly known today as Nablus. Um, and uh, 
there would be a ceremony there, and half the tribes would stand on one on one of the mounts and the other half on the other mount, and they would exchange uh, uh, blessings and curses. And we read about this more further on in the book of Deuteronomy, so it's interesting that it's mentioned here, but it's just a mention, and uh, a little bit later on we'll read more of the details about it. But I find it very interesting for another reason that it's mentioned right here, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Then, I'm just going to read, continue to read. Now we're up, we, we made it up to chapter 12, verse 1. And I'm going to read this because I want you to hear the segue into what really becomes the main topic for much of Parshat Re. These are the decrees and the ordinances that you shall observe to perform in the land that Hashem, the God of your forefathers, has given you to possess it all the days that you live on the land. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations that you are driving away worship their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every leafy tree. You shall break apart their altars. You shall smash their pillars and their sacred trees and their sacred trees shall you burn in the fire. Their carved images shall you cut down and you shall obliterate their name from that place. You shall not do this to Hashem your God. Rather, only in the place that Hashem your God will choose from among all your tribes to place his name there shall you seek out his presence and come there. And there shall you bring your burnt offerings and feast offerings, your tithes and what you raise up with your hands, your vow offerings and your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your cattle and your flocks. You shall eat before Hashem your God and you shall rejoice with your every undertaking, you and your households, as Hashem, your God, has blessed you. Bah, there we go. That's it. That's the big reveal here. That's what I've been talking about. The place where Hashem will choose. Now, Moshe does not once refer to it here as the Holy Temple, Beit HaMikdash, or even Mikdash. I don't believe it's referred to in this parsha as Mikdash at all, but it's always referred to as the place that Hashem will choose. Hamakom Asher. How does it say it exactly? It says, it changes every now and again, but rather it says in Hebrew, Hamakom Asher Yivachar Hashem Eloikechem Mikol Shivtechem Lasumet Shmosham. The place that Hashem will choose among your tribes to place his name there. Okay, so Moshe is telling Israel that as you settle the land and as you become established, there will, become a t there will come a time when uh, it will be incumbent upon you to build a, a house for Hashem in the place that Hashem will choose. Now, before we go on to talk about what all that means, the place that Hashem will choose, I just want to get back to that first word of the parasha re and i find it very significant very fascinating that this parasha which again introduces front and center uh, clearly explicitly for the first time in the five books of the torah this understanding that there's going to be a place uh, we've talked about i mean it's been implied before obviously because we've talked about the festivals and that you bring your 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 offerings to, to, to the to the to the altar, et cetera, et cetera. I, I have to say that I have to sort of uh, um, qualify what I'm saying. But here is where it really becomes clear that there there is a commandment and a time and a place where this will actually take place. Of course, the commandment we've known ever since ever since the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 8, and they shall build for me a sanctuary, and I shall dwell amongst them. And that took place initially, as we know, in the wilderness, in the tabernacle. But the tabernacle is not simply a wilderness uh, device that will, that will become obsolete, God forbid, once inside the land. Now, we do know that historically the tabernacle existed for many hundreds of years once Israel entered the land, and it was only during the the time of the reign of King David that the, be, the the initial start of building the Holy Temple began. But it's very clear from this parasha re'eh that 
the holy temple is really the focus of of your existence in the land of Israel now. It's not the only thing, but it's the central thing, and it is the center, and it's the heart. It's the, it's the living, beating heart of the people. And that's why people are, are we just learned that you will go there and you will rejoice there, you and your family, with everything. You, 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 will, you will rejoice with all that Hashem has given you at the Holy Temple, and of course you'll bring gifts the gifts that Hashem has given you, you will you will bring back to Hashem. You'll be, you know, uh, regifting, as it were. Uh, but that word re, which means see, and again I mentioned before, it's very curious because re introduces the idea of the blessings and the curses, and uh, that we'll talk about later in the book of Deuteronomy. So it's interesting that it's mentioned here. But that same word re, um, which means see was very prominent um, a long time ago, all the way back in the book of, of uh, Genesis, at the Akedah, at the binding of Yitzhak, the binding of, of Isaac on Mount Moriah, and of course, after Avraham bound his son, according to Hashem's commandment, and was going to offer him up to Hashem, according to Hashem's commandment, uh, Avraham uh, reached, uh, stretched out his arm, picked up the the slaughtering knife, and as he lifted up his arm, um, uh, an angel of Hashem called to him from heaven. I'm reading all the way back in the book of Exodus, chapter 22, verse 11, and said, Avraham, Avraham, and he said, Here I am. He many, here I am. And he, the angel, said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, nor do anything to him. For now I know that you are a God-fearing man, since you have not withheld your son, and your only one from me. And Avraham raised his eyes and saw, right? He saw, re ra behold a ram, afterwards caught in the thicket by its horns. So Avraham went and took the ram and offered it up as an offering instead of his son. And Avraham called the name of that site Hashem Yira'e. Hashem will see. As it is said this day on the mountain, Hashem will be seen, Hashem Yira'e. Right, what's the mountain? Well, that was Mount Moriah, wasn't it? And Mount Moriah is a place of the Holy Temple. And Avraham, he called it right there. Avraham called it and he said, this is going to be the place of the Holy Temple. This is a place where we see, we see Hashem's presence and where Hashem sees us. This is a place where we, we see eye to eye with Hashem, as it were. And he, because he saw eye to eye with Hashem. He was willing to do Hashem's bidding and Hashem was willing to to do Avraham's bidding, as it were. They saw, they saw they're in the same place, and being in the same place is what the Holy Temple is all about. So Avraham called it right there, and he used that word, re, right, see. And what are we told? We're told in a few places, but also here in this week's parasha, re, that we are to be seen three times a year in the Holy Temple, right? We just we bring our need to go there on the on the three pilgrimage festivals: uh, Passover, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, and to bring offerings and to uh, participate in the festivities and also to be seen by Hashem. Hashem wants to see us. He wants our presence near Him, just like we want Hashem's presence near us. So I find it very fascinating that this week's parsha is called Re, because in the Swiss Parsha, the word to choose, Yivchor, is mentioned 18 times, as is the word Makom, place, and in the context of Hashem will choose a place for His name to dwell, it's 16 times. Uh, so 16 times we're told that there's going to be this place that Hashem's going to choose for us all to bring our offerings and to bring our our, our tithes, etc., etc. And it's, again, 16 times means that, that 16 times in this week's Parsha, there's another little um, blurb, as it were, about how great it's going to be in the Holy Temple. I'd just like to also mention that um, 
what I just read a minute ago. Um, I want to say, maybe I didn't read it yet. It says uh, in, in chapter 12, verse, nine, verse 8, you shall not do like everything that we do here today. Rather, every man what is proper in his eyes. For you will not yet have for you will not for you will not yet have come to the resting place or to the heritage that Hashem your God gives you. You shall cross the Jordan and settle in the land that Hashem your God causes you to inherit. And he will give you rest from all your enemies all around, and you will dwell securely. And it shall be that the place where Hashem your God will choose to rest his name, there shall you bring everything that I command you your burnt offerings and your feast offerings, your tithes and what you raise up with your hands and the choice of what you offerings, uh, blah, 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 you have out to Hashem, etc., etc., etc. What I wanted to mention here was he will give you rest from you, all your enemies around and you will dwell securely. Uh, peace, security is part of this promise. It's part of the package of the Holy Temple. What comes first? The Holy Temple or peace? Well, that's a good question. That's a very good question, I think a very relevant question to our day, because on the one hand, we really can't um, establish the Holy Temple in a, in a time of conflict. We really need peace, and I think more so than ever today. I mean, when King Solomon, who was the king of peace, I mean, his name, King Melech Shlomo, means peace, and he had peace. David was a conqueror. And David established peace, and, and Shlomo, Solomon inherited that peace, and he built the first temple. And, of course, the second temple was built in a time of uh, when the, the, the leading power on earth, led by Cyrus, uh, sanctioned Israel's building the temple. So peace seems to be a very essential ingredient for obvious reasons, and also for spiritual reasons. Who wants to to build a place for Hashem that's going to be built out of conflict and, and violence. Hashem is, and Hashem says, in this place I will establish peace. That's a, that's a quote from the prophet Haggai. So, on the other hand, maybe establishing the Holy Temple is what will bring the peace, because once we have a central place on earth for people of all nations to to come and worship the one God, maybe that's what is going to to bring the peace. So it's sort of a um, interesting uh, intellectual uh, discussion, but beyond the intellectual discussion, it's also a very practical matter. Where where does it begin? How does it begin? And uh, which is perhaps why he, we need some an amazing leader who can cut through that Gordian knot of contradictions or of, you know, what comes first and then just get down to it. Now, we do know in the wilderness, when Israel built the tabernacle, that it was a time when Israel was at peace with itself. Everybody was busy working on this project, on this uh, mission, and working very, very happily together. And there was no outside interference either. So, you know, perhaps just go ahead and do it. And uh, as soon as you start doing it and people see that you're serious, then everybody's going to shape up and, uh, and uh, you know, fall in line. But it take, will take a very courageous leader, leadership, to, to actually initiate such a thing. And again... We are very busy uh, preparing for it, very, very busy uh, advocating for it, and um, um, when we choose our leaders, this is something that um, that we have to be thinking about. You know, what we need a leader of, of, of courage, a leader who is who is righteous, and. Um, they're hard to come by, I think, any time in today's world. They're really hard to come by. But that's what we're that's what we're working toward. In any case, peace, security, it's something that Israel longs for today. And um, 
works for today. So there's, you know, there's real peace, which is when nations and peoples can just get together and uh, appreciate one another. And then there's, you know, peace of paper, right? The piece of paper, whether you want to spell it P-I-E-C-E or P-E-A-C-E, you know, all these agreements and uh, contracts written up between nations which um, don't necessarily have any meaning, don't necessarily guarantee peace, don't necessarily guarantee uh, people uh, learning how to live together. So there's two types of peace. There's real peace and then there's false peace or a piece of paper. We're looking for the real peace. And um, hopefully we will attain it. And hopefully uh, sometime in that timeline, before, during, or after, we will be building the Holy Temple. And hopefully it'll all be happening very soon. Uh, sometimes you look around and say, wow, you know, we're talking hundreds of years, maybe. I don't know. You don't know. The world changes quickly. And um, what is true today can can change very radically, very quickly. So I am personally very optimistic. And how can we not be optimistic when Hashem is, has, has told us that it's going to happen, when our prophets, uh, prophets have told us that it's going to happen, and so many things that our prophets have told us will happen have already happened, and they've been happening a lot in our time, certainly in the past 100, 150 years. So uh, there's a lot of good reasons to feel very encouraged. This week's Parsha Re'e also talks about other uh, very essential issues. For example, um, prophets. You know, Moshe says, I'm not the only prophet. There will be prophets after me. How do you know if they're true prophets or they're false prophets? And so he, he describes uh, how, you, how you test the veracity of someone who claims to be a prophet. And if they tell you to, to um, disregard the Torah, the commandments, any of the commandments, they're not a true prophet, they're a false prophet. And if they simply, you know, do something miraculous, you can't just accept that as a, as a sign of prophecy, but it has to be examined in light of what they're trying to achieve, what they're trying to say. So it's a basic test. Uh, and if you know of, of uh, a false prophet, it's incumbent upon you to, to uh, call that person out, to bring it to the attention of the authorities so that the false prophet can be uh, dealt with because false prophets are exceedingly destructive and they have to be uh, caught and dealt with in good time. Also mentions, you know, if an entire city goes astray, right? And if an entire city starts uh, worshiping uh, idolatry, um, that city needs to be destroyed. It happens destroyed, and the city just uh, raised to the ground and uh, never occupied again. A situation which our sages say never actually happened. Um, there was never actually such a case where an entire city, uh, Israelite city, uh, went so astray that it became irredeemable and needed to be destroyed. But these are some of the things that we talk about in this week's parasha. Also talks about the need to take care of the Levites in our midst. Because the Levites, of course, like the Kohanim, uh, have no nachala, they have no land inheritance in the land of Israel. Um, uh, we know that there, there were, I think, 48 Levitical cities where Levites, uh, and of course, Le by Levite now, I mean any, any, uh, any one of the Levitical tribes, which would include Kohanim, have, they have uh, these rights to live in these cities where uh, the city I think uh, is defined as also having some some surrounding territory where where I think a minimum amount of agriculture could take place for the sustenance but other than that bare sustenance uh, the Levites are dependent upon the other Israelites to, uh, 
to provide them with their sustenance. And so they talk a lot in this parasha about about the um, tithing, the tithes that go to the Levites, along with um, along with uh, widows and and orphans, being people, of course, that um, that uh, at least in that time were uh, might be unable to provide for themselves, and they need to be looked after. So, what's being described here? By Moshe, this future society uh, that he's telling Israel to establish when they enter into the land is a beautiful, beautiful nation that upholds the laws of the Torah, that has a central place of of worship. That place being being uh, the place that Hashem chooses, and that has people looking out for one another, taking care of one another. And it even speaks of if you expand your borders and you're further away from the from the mikdash from the temple and it's not so easy and you want to eat meat and all sorts of provisions, practical provisions, and also very, very high, highly aimed um, uh, statutes and, and and commandments intended to really make it a, a holy nation. And a holy nation is one that that distinguishes itself by by caring for one another, by taking care of one another, and by and by being close to Hashem. Now, I want to get into this whole idea. I mentioned that 16 times as we talked about the place that Hashem will choose. So it's very interesting, you know, to choose implies that you haven't made your mind up yet. Now, that concept uh, in itself seems a very odd concept when we're talking about Hashem, because Hashem, you know, He knows what's going on. He doesn't. He doesn't have to make up His mind. We don't think. I mean, I don't know. Um, and also, we understand that the Holy Temple was built and will be built on Mount Moriah. And on Mount Moriah, of course, is where the Akedah, where the binding of Isaac Yitzhak took place. It's also where earlier, uh, where where uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, had built their altar after they, after their uh, transgression of eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and of course, it's the place of the Garden of Eden, the place where Adam was created from the earth, that is beneath where the altar itself is located, and we also understand that the the Ark of the Covenant, which rests in the Holy of Holies, uh, sits atop the foundation stone. And the foundation stone is the location of the where where creation first came into being, where it first transpired. So knowing all this, it seems like a no-brainer. Like, of course, God's going to choose this place. So what's this choice about? And why are we not told here? Why doesn't Moshe say, you know? Um, God's going to choose Jerusalem. So there's all different answers uh, for this question. It's a very good question. And the two answers that I find to be very compelling, one is that sort of a practical Hashem, if Hashem had revealed it to Israel then, then Israel's enemies would have occupied that land, making it uh, very difficult for Israel to build a, a temple there. I, and guess what? We're in that situation now. Secondly, that Hashem wanted Israel to discover this place um, in the goodness, in the fullness of time, to discover uh, where it's to be built um, and to make the decision to build it. And of course, that takes place in the time of King David, who uh, understands that Jerusalem, his capital, is to be the place where the Holy Temple is to be built, the place where Hashem chose, which is why sometimes in Hebrew, the Holy Temple is referred to as Beta Bechirat, the Chosen House. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.